Now, this one I really want to labor over. About 43 years ago, we recognized that sugars of all type fed cancer. Within a short time, we recognized it also fed viruses and bacteria and mold and yeast and fungus. But let's go back to the cancer part of this. Now, this wasn't new. We weren't the first people. As a matter of fact, there were scientists more than a century ago discussing this. But very few people took heed. And as a matter of fact, when I would go out back four decades ago and speak about this at conferences where physicians were there, they would mock me. Well, here is the latest absolute chart of exactly why sugars of all type feed cancer and make it grow in the body. So let's look at it. I'll go through this very quickly and simply. So you have the glucose. Now, let me mention to you, don't think that this is just table sugar. So this can be honey. This can be maple syrup. This can be agave syrup. This can be date sugar. This can be coconut sugar. Anything that is extracted from a whole food, even if it's from a whole food and condensed, is a sugar. There's really clear evidence in our arena and in other people's arenas in science today that fruit sugar is the most grievous. It's the one that causes the most growth of cancer, but we won't focus in on that today. So when you consume the glucose, it goes down through this cycle, the TCA cycle, as you see. Now that's a normal cycle that everything that you swallow is gonna go through. Now I want you to see the offshoots to both the left and the right here. So you see the growth factors on the left up at the very top there and the growth factors on the right and the citrate actually turns into acetylcholine and moves in, and you end up with RAS, MEK1-2, and ERK12 growth factors on that side. Now, this is a nucleotide a process that is happening. Now, this is actually taking the cancer and saying, go ahead, allow yourself to multiply. And that's where we have cancer moving, gravitating from one place to another, migrating from one place to another. On the other side, the growth factors are P13K, AKT, MTOR, and HIF. And over to you see the left side of that, or maybe in your case, the right side, FOX is a glucose uptake. Now, this is exactly what happens. And these growth factors can no longer be overlooked or denied. I mandate, if I were in charge, that every medical doctor in the world has to study this, understand that this is solid, clear science, evidential science that is backed by massive work done globally by the most incredibly effective research scientists on the planet today. So why we've seen such remarkable success here in helping people bring about their own recovery, because we pulled all sugars over 40 years ago out of the diets of people with any form of cancer. Now, I know a lot of the lesser knowledgeable holistic doctors think that there's some cancers that you can eat fruit and others. Abolish that silliness. Learn what you need to learn and study what is now available for you to study. And don't have opinions on what you don't know anything about. I try not to do that in my own life. It's not always easy, but it works most of the time. Now, here's something that we used to think was a sidebar. Oh, yes, well, you need to sleep. <laughs> no longer is it a sidebar. We actually realize a great way to make yourself sick, and I don't care what sickness you choose to uh, embrace, but all sicknesses will come to you. Hypertension, diabetes, heart attacks, strokes, metabolic syndrome, if you don't sleep well enough. And sadly, when I would be speaking to people when I was a very young man, very rarely did I meet somebody who had a, a serious sleep problem. And now when I ask that question, as I travel the globe, inevitably it's more than 50%, 60% of people in the audience raise their hand, sometimes hundreds of people in that audience. When I say, how many of you do not sleep well? They raise their hand. The same thing happens right here on the Hippocrates campus. So this means that you're actually setting yourself up by weakening your overall immunity so that diseases just walk right into the body and take foot. And you don't want this to happen. 
So we spent a lot of time in our energy medicine department here with state-of-the-art technologies that help people reprogram their brains, get the neuron functions to move in the right direction, to relax the overall sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, and they can get into deeper RAM sleeps. There are some people after menopause, women, of course, that in fact have sleep problems. That can be remedied too with natural hormonal therapies along with these technologies. So don't let this be something that's chronic in your life. This has become a prominent factor in why people are sick or not sick, why people age prematurely, or they do not age prematurely. Now we're gonna talk about food. So we brought this into different sites. How diet can be either the greatest physician or your best nemesis, the one that fights you the best, your biggest enemy, et cetera. And most people have an enemy in food. Now, let me reference this by telling you that we don't recognize that we have addiction to food. And I don't want to talk about substance addiction, the sugars and the fats. I've labored over that often with you. What I want to speak about is the patterns, the sociological patterns, the emotional patterns you have to food. Remember, as a little girl, a little boy, mom and dad taught you that food was love. And so you embraced food as love. So when you weren't feeling quite good about yourself, how you indulged is eat food. And the foods that were always love related, were high sugar, high fat foods. And this is why we get into these patterns. We socialize around these foods because everyone had the same type of upbringing. I don't care where you live on the planet Earth. We all had this ideology about food. It is actually something that has to do with emotional kindness. Now, there, in one of my books many years ago, Life Force, I wrote that what distinguishes the human species from all other creatures on, on the planet in one unique way is we sit at the table and the old terminology was we break bread. And somehow we have this pattern when we sit and eat, we talk to one another. If there's not food there, we seem to have a difficult time expressing ourselves. So with all of that, understand what we're gonna talk about now is really always not because you are a person who's not bright and doing the wrong thing or a person who's not knowledgeable, you're a person who has addictive patterns. So here we are, with something that's a break from the addictive patterns. We're looking at a period from the beginning of the 21st century, 2000, for 18 years, and the increase in plant-based consumption. Now, I will literally express my feeling on this. The systems around us has failed us. The food system has failed us, and when that fails us, then we go to the healthcare system, which has failed us. Matter of fact, it's become the number three killer in almost all of the developed world. But look at the increase in plant-based consumption. Now, grant you, a lot of these people are embracing a much better diet than the Western diet, high meat, high sugar diets, but it's a lot of junk food, but at least it's a start. There was one year that it literally went up 2000% plant-based consumption, and it's not expected to drop. Because today we have the scientific community globally talking about this, saying for Earth to sustain itself, for we humans to be on this planet, we must all become plant-based eaters. The way we consume animal foods today, it's not sustainable. And there's no question about this. This is not debatable anymore. And what we also have to know is that people are recognizing they've got to take responsibility for their own well-being. Because seemingly, depending upon others, hasn't worked out well, has it for you? So this is a great thing. Let's hope you're part of those statistics if you're not currently. And let's hope you don't just move into a non-animal food diet, but a non-animal food healthy diet, whole plant-based and raw as much as possible. The next plateau we all have to move to, and I know that most of us are just struggling in this medical community to get you to just be plant-based eaters is to get to non-processed. They talk about whole food diets. Well, once you cook them, they're processed. So that's not really a whole food at this point. So we distinguish the difference between a whole food being something that's organic, plant-based, fresh as possible, and uncooked and unprocessed. That's where we have to go. 
And that's what we've been showing and proving here for 70 years has been most effective on maintaining youth and fighting and preventing disease. Your protein sources really matter. So a lot of people out there today are still uh, under the uh, unfortunate understanding that the dairy and meat industry worked really hard and spent millions and millions of euros and dollars on getting you to believe that the only good sources of protein are these animal-based foods. Well, Australia, which surprises me sometimes, they come up with really great studies. So they did a study on all types of death, mortality as we call it. And they looked at men that were maturing, older men. And what they found is that little incremental increases in animal food increase the death rate substantially. The lowest amount that they looked at by eating like one meal a week of animal-based foods to your diet was 12% higher death. And it went up to 23% higher death. Now think about that. One, two meals of meat a week, up to 23% higher death rate. Conversely, the total opposite of it when people increased dramatically, they're plant-based. So as an example, if you're eating 10 animal-based meals a week, and remember, you have three meals a day, you have seven days in a week, most of you, that's 21 meals. Well, if you had 10 of them that were animal-based foods, you're gonna have a death rate up to 23% higher. Let's imagine that you dramatically reduce that by five. You're only having five animal-based meals a week. Now you increase your longevity by 25 to 28%. So if you take the 23% increase in death and the 25% or 28% increase in longevity, there's almost a 40 to 50% gap between people who don't eat meat and do eat meat.